So as I mentioned previously, Made is working on how do we improve, reduce all the different forms of sampling bias, cognitive biases that occur in our modeling? We have lots of choices. We have lots of things we do with our models. And so she'll talk about how she's using spatial data analytics to deal with objectively sampling bias. Made, please take it away. Okay, morning everyone. I'll be giving um, two presentations today, but I'll be starting off with spatial data analytics to support declustering approaches. Um, so we know that all sparsely sampled spatial data sets are biased and cell based declustering is the most applied approach for the bias in such data sets. And the current practice for the choice of cell size in cell based declustering is irrational and subjective because it's overly conservative. Um, we propose a novel method called spatial statistics based assignments of declustering cell size, which objectively um, selects the cell size using spatial point statistics such as nearest neighbors and um, replicate to determine the scales of data clustering between the data points. Using this method, um, is, um, is we aim to automate and improve objectivity for the mitigation of sampling bias in our data sets. The motivation for this work stems from the impact of spatial bias in data sets based on the work of Petri in 2016, which saw the use of um, naive statistics from preferentially sampled data leads to an erroneous 48% in mean initial production opposed to using the declustered statistics. It is therefore imperative to correct the raw statistics when formulating representative statistics for uncertainty modeling, making bias a significant issue in unconventionals. Since most um, subsurface data sets, as we discussed, are preferentially sampled, we need to information to make predictions and decisions in an undrilled location because of uncertainty and bias. It is necessary to develop a new automated quantitative method that objectively and robustly identifies the optimal cell size for cell based clustering in sparsely sampled spatial data sets. Now, moving on to the current approach, we're going to show the effects of using bias um, data sets as is and how it affects reserve estimation. Looking at this example, highlighting the steps for the current approach in a data set that has been preferentially sampled from high porosity regions in the reservoir with porosity values between 5% and 25% over an area of interest. The naive statistics of the data as it has a mean porosity of 14.5% and an oil in place of 0.15% multiplied by the poor volume, which we estimate as 14.5 million barrels. Then following the current approach in handling bias data, the first thing we do is to divide the volume of interest using the grid. Here we chose a 10 by 10 grid and then count the number, then assign weights used by counting the number of um, occupied cells in the datum. And this is very essential because sometimes you might have a cell that has no, no data available in it. Then after assigning the weights, we plot um, we, we plot a decluster with porosity versus, we plot the cell sizes, a range of cell sizes versus the declustered mean porosity, and we choose the minimum point and assign that as our optimal cell size and determine the declustered porosity at that point. That's how the current approach works. Doing that, we discovered that the declustered mean porosity was 12% and therefore the change in original oil in place was by 17%. So if we're using the naive statistics as is, we would make an erroneous um, reserve estimation. Although this already gives us the declustered um, porosity values, we, are, we, we hypothesize and we've also shown that this is actually overly conservative and often points in the right direction. It's not usually the actual value. So for the methodology I'm proposing, recall the empirical approach for cell size selection is to attempt a range of cell sizes between each member and cases, and then select the cell size that minimizes the declustered feature mean, no, right? And knowing spatial data clustering is related to configuration of data points in space, spatial statistics such as um, nearest neighbor is used for the methodology. Nearest neighbor basically is an inter-event method that measures the distance between each point and the next closest point compared to the expected distance of such points from complete spatial random points, which is also known as um, a homogeneous person point process. After this, if the nearest, basically the method, the method applied here, we state that if the mean nearest neighbor distance is 
less than the exported value at complete spatial random, then the point process is said to be clustered. If it's greater than, we say it's dispersed. If it's otherwise, that is it's equal to zero, we say it's completely random. So the selection of cell size using this method is the points at which uh, is, the, is the intersample distance at which we have the inflection and the K distance graph the point of infection and case distance graph, which is the nominal size of clusters. So we trace that down to the distance and we read it off as our inputs for cell size using the nearest neighbors. Moving on to replace K, here replicate utilizes the number of samples within the defined radius on an event. You count it and compare it to the exhortation from complete spatial random over a given radii to check if the point pattern is clustered or dispersed. Then we calculate then when we do that, we calculate the confidence interval for a significant level of 95% of the replicate function. Then we apply a bootstrap to the data for different sets of realizations. The point at which the data is said to be significantly clustered, that is it crosses the upper confidence boundary above and also above the CSR line, we call that point a crossover point. That is the maximum departure from CSR over simulated upper confidence boundary at a 95% significance level. That, that point when you trace it down to your radius becomes an input for the cell size selection in cell basic clustering. Explaining how the cell size now, the cell sizes we're choosing using these two methods would explain the workflow for testing um, SSADC. First, we construct a 2D geological truth model using a very um, sequential Gaussian simulation. Then we create multiple realizations combining random and regular sampling with varying degrees of bias using rejection sampling. We determine the optimal cell size when you use a um, nearest neighbor that's into sample distance at the elbow. Um, using replicates, it's the uh, distance at the crossover points. Then we'll calculate the, the clustered mean at this optimal cell sizes and estimate the relative error to quantify accuracy. Now, looking at the results we got, um, looking at the truth model generation, um, we can see here that this is a low degree of cluster. Looking at the true model, you can see like it appears like it's a little bit of random, but it's not random. Then here we can see that there is medium degree of cluster. You can see a cluster here. They are starting to form up in the high porosity regions. And high degree of clusters, you can see here, is like really densely populated over the space. Moving on, we look at the results of the nearest neighbor. For nearest neighbor, we see that with the points at the elbow for the low degree of bias was found to be 44.21. For medium, it was 55, and for high, it was almost 70. We repeated the same thing using replace K. You can see for when there was low degree of bias, there is no much um, difference from the complete spatial random line, but we still found a way to pick the maximum departure. And the cell size impulse for that was found as 48, and repeated for over the other two cases was found as 50 and 59. Using the current approach for the cell size selection, we found that um, for these same cases, the low was found to be 220, the medium was 60, the high was 80. But you can see that for the no, it finds it a little bit difficult to select the minimizing cell size because it's kind of like almost on a straight line. As the degree of bias increases, then you see a more apparent structure and choosing the minimizing points that you pick as your declustered mean. Now, using converting the um, cell sizes that we had and using it as inputs into the cell-based declustering, cell declustering um, algorithm, we found out that the most preferred method was replicates compared to the truth. As you can see here, it replicates gives in the low bias case 0.124 compared to the truth at 0.122. Same behavior and improvements for the medium bias case and the high bias case. But however, when you look at nearest neighbor, you see that it performs similarly to the current approach here. So the brings us to the question of why. This why may be attributed to the possible loss of information about observed patterns since distance is the only parameter governing these statistics and there is even nearest neighbor. Now we look at all over all realizations that we had and, the and we calculated the expected clustered mean porosity. For cell-based clustering, that's the current method, it was 7.7%. The nearest neighbor was 7.67. That's why it seems like they were superimposed on each other. There's 
actually like an orange line and a blue line that's superimposed. Then for replace K, we can see that the expected value was 3.85. Based on this, we can see that there is an error shift and improvement between replicates and cell-based clustering currents approach of selecting cell size of 3.9%. Between nearest neighbor and CBD, we can see like a 0.04%. So even though you feel like um, nearest neighbor is not um, really that much of a difference it's still preferable because it's automated and objective and considers the special context of the data we're dealing with now looking at the key points of so summary to summarize everything we've said so far although the current approach often points in the right direction it's mostly conservative cell size selection using sssdc is optimal regardless of varying degrees of bias in the data set and it's recommended for optimal spatial bias and especially with sparsely sampled settings the next steps now um, to further this work will be to see if we can develop a new locally adaptive declustering method to work with data sets from non-stationary population densities. I think this will be an important extension of the current methodologies and that should be able to be done using Cox processes. Um, are there any questions or should I just go into the second portion of the presentation? Mayday, that's fine to continue on. And if you, you want, just do a short summary of this, this second part, and then we'll have time for questions afterwards. Fantastic. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the clarification. Okay, so the second part of the presentation is machine learning to support analog studies. Um, there is no known metric that summarizes many high dimensional features into a useful measure to group and identify analog signals, resources, or items, because it's an intrinsically um, complicated, multi very spatial temporal problem. Hence, we propose a metric that can be used for network quantification to support optimum decision making and visualize the uncertainty space. The metric that we're going to talk about was um, created using the workflow that utilizes multi dimensional scaling, density based um, clustering, and the naive based classifier using the distance function as a clustering basis to visualize the associated uncertainty space. For this particular work, we demonstrate this um, for community development, but with the work supported by um, the IC Square Institute at UT Austin and co-authors um, Pog and Kamakarik, and plan to use the developed methodologies and extend appropriately for selection of analog wells, reservoirs, plays, energy such as um, geothermal, solar, wind, etc. So to demonstrate the performance of the proposed workflow, this experimental setup is used for testing. Knowing that this workflow can be applied to any high dimensional data sets, let's look at this case study that identifies analog um, communities in Texas to support optimum economic development for, and decision making. So the steps first is to pre-process your available data, perform multi-dimensional scaling on it, then the output of your, of your multi-dimensional scaling, the projections, you perform DB scan clustering on it, then you predict the labels of obtained from DB scan using naive based classifier, you assess the goodness of the model with the accuracy and reliability checks, then you visualize the uncertainty space and determine your similarity scores and group similarity scores. First, the synthetic data generator was um, used, that was created that um, generated data based on existing socioeconomic ranges and known feature relationships for population, um, household income, commute time, and crime rates. And then the sampling was done using bivariate rates Gaussian distribution sampling. Next, we'll briefly show the results from the multidimensional scaling. Um, here we can see that most, after MDS was performed and then we scaled the markers using the normalized prediction features, we can see that um, like cities are, are, are grouped in the same space. Here, even cities with high population densities are grouped together, medium population densities are right here, then low population densities are here. If you look closely, you can see like a little bit of tiny dots that fall in between, I think maybe we'll tend We'll talk about that in the next slide. So basically applying this population to other um, features, we can see that there are tentatively three groupings across all features. Then we we'll perform the, um, the clustering results on the MDS projections obtained. Doing that and using tuned hyperparameters, we see for sure that there are three clusters. This is not a cluster. This is just um, a cluster that holds the outlier labels. Knowing that there are three clusters in the data sets now, we use naive based classifier to predict the clusters and then we verify if what we had was right, if the prediction was right and check the accuracy. But the interesting thing is, let's look at the posterior probability based maps generated by the naive classifier algorithm. 
when we look at this, we see that, okay, if you, uh, this is cluster one here, the first cluster where you have your data sets, if you select this particular point, which is CT19, the probability of it belonging to CT19 is actually 1.0, right? But if you look at the particular city on the boundary, that's CT76, for instance, how do you interpret these boundary cities? So for what we do is we look at the posterior probability associated with it. So for this particular city, which is CT76, it has a 0 0.08 probability of belonging to cluster one and um, a point one one probability of belonging to cluster two and a point eight nine probability of belonging to cluster three. So this helps visualize the uncertainty attached with the city groupings. Now we look at the community similarities score that we created and we use we created prototypes using the centroids of each clusters and then the similarity score basically is the distance between each community in the space. We can see some outlier cities here like city seventy six right like sorry rather 67 60, city 62 which is an outlier city that we don't know where it exactly belongs but based on the um the clusters that gives the highest probability it tags it as cluster number two and then we can see like a distant a city that is within the group and we call that a um, group consistency score it is the ones that's very close to the prototype we have the group consistency score for that as well. So I know that this is a little bit um, um, difficult, so I say, to wrap our head around because it's about community business and town planning, geographies and all that. So the next steps would be like, we can propose, we, this workflow we propose can be extended and applied to a variety of prompts in energy problems, such as um, weld analogs, reservoir analogs, energy analogs, and project analogs in the business economic sense of view. Um, with this, I would like to conclude my presentations and welcome any questions and like to thank the following companies for their sponsorship and their construction. Thank you. Medea, I feel like we should pay you for overtime today. <laughs> I feel like you, 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 you almost did like double duty on this. And I do appreciate all this wonderful work that you showed today.